recording. Hey, um, so uh, we got, uh, we had a great uh, uh, cast, uh, consensus collab uh, with the uh, Casanova. Uh, yeah, Josh, he showed us his uh, Casanova implementation. And then we uh, were all uh, uh, trying to figure out what uh, what Greg was up to with the square root. Uh, 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 and uh, error correcting code uh, consensus. Uh, looking forward to that. Uh, and uh, let's see, in the channel, we had a few things uh, that uh, came up the computational calculus. Uh, uh, I guess the, uh, uh, the an ambient calculus white paper was one of them. Um, there was uh, uh, the uh, uh, what do you call it? The uh, monadic party. Uh, Late, uh, yeah, I was I was uh, uh, showing this to Josh before, and uh, Raul asked me to to put some information about that, about the Merkle trees and, and the recursion schemes. So, uh, awesome. It's somehow related, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, who wants to start? Oh, Jim, did you want to talk about the ambient calculus? Because I I don't know much about it, but I hear yeah. it coming up in several different contexts and I'm, I'm getting really interested and I'm going to start looking into it at some point in time on my own anyways, but I, I wanted to hear maybe what you had to say about it first. I'm afraid to say anything at all. <laughs> okay, because, you know, I've been working for decades on what I call the information problem. Yeah. Everything we're doing is the information problem. And okay, well then maybe, uh, maybe as a first step, yeah, what is, what is the information problem to you? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, in the past, I've looked, come at it from different, point, you know, uh, many different directions. I mean, yeah. it's one problem, every problem comes to it. So it really doesn't matter which problem you choose to uh, address it from. I mean, I was looking at it in terms of objects in the state of becoming. Okay, I you know the whole orthodoxy of objects can never change their behavior was just wrong in my view. <laughs> and it's, you know, and it's how uh, objects become uh, is my interest. And of course, um, you know, that uh, uh, relates to, uh, 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 you know, consensus becoming, uh, consensus be or anything becoming. And um, these things, well, are categories. Are, they're types, okay? They're 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 they they, they well they 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 become monads in that they're they the uh, uh, we specify a type spe specificity down to uh, uh, the emergence of a an element in you know uh, in, in, in the known elements of a category um, uh, so uh, uh, but uh, uh, and uh, the ambient calculus is a, you know gives us a formality of understanding uh, uh, a uh, uh, of that in the e rights sense. You know, there's a trusted environment that does its thing independent of the whole of the of the environment that it's in. Okay, we have an environment, and you have a locality defined here, and this is, you know, this brings it all back to physics and everything else, and that you're, you know, you're you're put, you're defining space uh, where uh, uh, you have uh, the, uh, these ambient boundaries that things come in up into and out of in a formal way and what the ambient 
afterwards he dies. And you know the the row calculus, or, you know, uh, uh, you know, it, it makes me a god in the sense of being able to orchestrate processing systems. With you know my 50 years of IT background, I see almost every problem as how do we orchestrate our processes? Okay, uh, you know that's in one sense uh, an important view of the information problem. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, uh, and you know, this white paper and this uh, this effort ambience that's happening uh, is uh, 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 is doing these peer to peer contracting, which I always think is so important. And it's using the process calculus, and I want to be able to. Uh, take the ideas from it. Uh, ambient calculus, which, you know, the mathematics of it is totally obscure, and I don't even want to know about it, really. But I would want to know how to model amb ambience in the row calculus. Okay, <laughs> I want a, a pattern for for dealing with these ambience. Uh, uh, so, uh, what is the what's the white paper called that you're referencing? Um, it's uh, um, that would be in the uh, in the uh, computational calculus. Oh, oh, you shared it already. All right, cool. Um, it was originally. Uh, it's interesting uh, in that uh, uh, I learned of this first through Digital Life Collective. Mm -hmm. The uh, uh, leader there, and I, I can't remember exactly the context he ran across it. Oh, okay. So this is the uh, uh, the GitHub version. Okay, there's the PDF link here. Cool. Um, somewhere, um, I find it easier, uh, nicer to read the GitHub than to read the PDF. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, I really haven't got into it in depth uh, yet. Uh, I was uh, 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 you know, in, in terms of you know mathematics. I mean, I was a star in college. Um, I always got all the extra credit and you know, the problems. Uh, but I, you know, I uh, uh, I'm retired. <laughs> I don't have the headspace for it at all. <laughs> so I, I, I come to a forum like this where we have a bunch of young guys who can tell me what the answers are, and I'll <laughs> take it for granted. I'll believe them. <laughs> uh, well, I'm just going to put it out there for the record. I don't think I can tell anybody the answers to anything. I can only speculate. That's that's about where my expertise is. That's right. Uh, but uh, I did want to ask you a question about the um, the information problem you're talking about. So you, you were talking about uh, localities and monads, and I just wanted to know uh, if there's a connection there, and, and if there is, what what that connection is. Yeah, well, yeah, um, uh, and I I was alluding to it. I was talking about you know uh, specifying a category down to an instance. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's defines an environment. Uh, locality uh, yeah. okay, type thing, and um, um, I haven't really gotten into Greg's uh, mapping of the process calculus into space uh, specifically. There again, I just take his word for it that this happens and it's going to be compatible with the yeah. stuff I'm thinking about. <laughs> right. <laughs> but um, uh, I think it's. Uh, uh, it it it, uh, it comes back to reflectivity and uh, being able to look at systems, you know, real systems, and uh, the, the the kinds of things that we're looking at. Sort of like everything comes together in category theory. And, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. And it, well, and it sounds like uh, Christian Williams is doing some interesting research into this, like reflective computation and. Uh, like a categorical foundation for 
uh, this reflective computation, which, uh, you know, is specifically in the context of the row calculus. Um, I don't think you have to know anything about it. I mean, you yeah. know, it's like the, uh, you know, if you look at set theory, okay, that's something that people understand, set theory. Yeah. If they understand that set theory is just one viewpoint of categories, yeah. okay, um, uh, uh, and they, uh, the, you know, and, and they look at logic as, you know, you know, Platonic logic or Boolean logic is only one way of doing logic. There's a million ways of doing logics. That's right. Okay. Well, there's a million ways of doing behavioral logic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, uh, and you know, uh, categories are the same way. There's a million ways of doing it. And that includes all of this other stuff. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, it's just an umbrella and, uh, uh, and nobody understands it. It's, you, know, like, <laughs> you know, you might as well call it quantum logic or yeah. the information problem. Nobody <laughs> understands it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what do they call us? Uh, so there's a, a joke, you know, that what it really is, is no rules. Yeah, no rules. Okay, we don't, Plato can't tell us that, you know, if a proposition can be true or false, and there's no third alternative. Okay, <laughs> nobody can make any such rules. And that applies to categories and generalized in terms of just, there's a relationship between things. And that relationship could be, you know, can be a type, it can be a behavior, it can be uh, a, a, a taste, a color, a, 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 a logical operation, whatever. Um, so uh, it's nothing magical, and except that it includes everything magic, all kinds of magic. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, I don't think, uh, 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 you know, I think that uh, um, I don't know uh, monads. Or, you know, is another thing that nobody understands. <laughs> but you know, I mean, it's just uh, uh, what is a monad? A monad, no, no, is just is simply an element of some category. Yeah, particularly a functor category. I'm sorry. Uh, particularly a functor category. Right. Uh, oh, but there, there's this joke that, uh, you know, category theory is, is just generalized abstract nonsense. Generalized what? Generalized abstract nonsense. Yeah. <laughs> generalized abstract nonsense. Well, that's what, you know, I mean, that's what, you know, classical logicians consider, uh, uh, you know, consider absurdity uh, to be absurd when we, when we have to learn to brace the paradox. <laughs> yeah. Well, I learned from, uh, I don't know how to say his first name, Bar Bartos Maluski. I, I think I posted uh, his category theory lectures. Yeah, uh, sure. I love those. Excellent. Oh, they're really, really good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah he talks about um, functors as containers. And so that was kind of, you know, why I was making a connection between the monads and the lo localities you were talking about. Yeah. I don't think I got that far but yet. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah. definitely I'll have to. They're good and they, they only get better too. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a, you know, because he did it for programmers rather than mathematicians. Right. You know, uh, 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 all, I mean, a number of light bulbs went off in my head. Yeah. You know, uh, uh, sort of like I've been thinking, well, category theory is for, you know, it's for the mathematicians. You know, I don't need, I, I need to understand the implications of it. Right. Uh, right. I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do it. I'm not going to be doing proofs in it yeah. in myself, <laughs> yeah. but um, uh, you know, watching this the lectures all of a sudden, you know, it, uh, a lot of it's demystified. Yeah, uh, and so uh, I don't feel uh, as far. It, it doesn't feel to be as nearly as foreign. So mm -hmm. I'm going to uh, probably uh, 
take the time to go through the rest of it. Yeah, cool. So, uh, Isaac, you mentioned that uh, uh, Monad, uh, so my question is, uh, is it the case that Monad must be a function? Because I, I see join, join operation, uh, uh, for, for join operation, uh, why is functor necessary? Uh, so, um, I see so, this is t to uh, to t, right? Uh -huh. t, t squared to t, right? This yeah. is like a join operation on, on the monad, right? Right. So, where where is in this operation function, right? Uh, yeah. So I, um, so where in this operation is there? Um. Now I wish because I had. Usually, oh, so 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 I think I think the functor there is uh, so you have products in this category. Obviously, if you're talking about t squared, right? Uh, so I think it's from this category to itself, where specifically you have these nice relationships between like your your products and your individual terms. So so from your t squared to your t, because I mean it it has a. I don't know whatever those properties are called, right? It has certain uh, like equations that it has to satisfy, right? Like you have the I know Greg calls them shape, wrap, and roll, uh, but I, I don't know what they're they're. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, 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 yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm I'm referring to 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 these methods because if if you take a look at, at the shape, wrap, and roll, yeah. Uh, so uh, you have this operation. Uh, so the, the, usually it's called bind, right? Or, or the, the, I don't know, select many or, or flat map, right? Okay. And, and, exactly, and, and the flat map yeah. uh, is exactly where the functor is, uh, you know, emerging. Yeah. This is like a combination of uh, of a join with the functor, but you know, I, I see this as combination of these two. Uh, so if you, if you just take a join, uh, so this is why I'm asking. If you, if you just take a join. Uh, no, you, you don't. You, you don't have a fact. So this is my like reasoning. So, so but a join sure. by itself is a monad. So I, I, I'm not sure because. Oh, okay. Well, neither am I. I that's in, what you Haskell, said. <laughs> in, in Haskell, you 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 define well. You you can you can define join and bind in, uh, one in terms of the other, right? So. Uh, But I, I don't think you need uh, you need uh, uh, yeah yeah if if you define join in terms of bind you definitely use a uh, use a function. So. I'm not sure. Um, is uh, uh, okay. I, normally you think of things you no know, monads as being mutable. I mean they're not mutable. Ultimately, but in application, there's something that, in application, <laughs> uh, uh, has a uh, 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 has a um, uh, 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 instantiation. I don't know what to call it. <laughs> You mean something like a state monad when you have uh, a state that is carried with each uh, operation? Like monad is like a sequence of operations, so you carry your state, and this is somehow like a mutation. Is this what you mean? Yeah. So. Hmm. Uh, you know that ambient calculus that that. Uh, several of you have been talking about seems like it would have application in the work that mark s miller is doing with electronic rights transfer protocol and those vats that he talks about but i go look at at the uh, faq page for for all that and I see, I don't, I see no references to the ambient calculus. In fact, I, I they don't seem to be worried too much about um, computational calculi at all from the level that they're looking at things. Right. Well, you know, I mean, if that is a very specific ambient, 
okay? It, it, it happens to be an ambient. Uh, um, uh, in terms of separation of concerns, I'm not sure that, that the computational, you know, how, uh, uh, how relevant it is, but I, I think it's exceedingly interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it relates to, you know, I mean, it makes a direct connection between uh, Milner's uh, E-Rights and uh, VATS to process calculus, which is yeah. why I want to uh, learn how to model ambience in Rowland. So Jim, you, you mentioned uh, this process orchestration is like <laughs> the, the biggest problem, right? And uh, well, that you know, if, if one one perspective on the one problem, there's only one problem. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I heard from from my colleagues that uh, you know, uh, when you program in the airline, right? You you you, you have uh, you have uh, like complete control of your processes. You, you can kill it. You can expect it to. Right. So, uh, so the, the the problem that uh, that that lacks, right? It's how how do you orchestrate? It? Because uh, so uh, you have names, right? You, you manipulate the names of the processes. You, you have like a uh, from simple uh, abstractions with the supervisor that you know uh, that uh, uh, controls other processes, and you know when then. This process is in error. You do something wrong. So my, my question is: uh, in, in, in this problem, uh, what do you think uh, naming is is part of this problem? How? Because we, we don't uh, just we don't think about that. We just uh, you know we just say you know the biggest problem in programming is you know naming the variables and you know, location validation. <laughs> this is something that you heard all the time. But so uh, this name of processes, if, if you have... Uh, well, that's part of what... I believe that's, you know, uh, basic in the ambient... In the ambient calculus is that the, the naming... Uh, that uh, the, the one thing that an ambient has in its environment is a name. And and anybody can use, in that environment can use that name to, to access the object. And you know, there's really, there's really a one-to-one -one correspondence between ambient environments and uh, namespaces or shards. But, uh, the uh, question is: Is this name uh, have some kind of structure, right? Is it is it just uh, like in PyCalculus? It's just just a name coming from the outside, or or it is have some kind of structure that is like. So, so meta level inside the, the ambient. Yeah, that's the, I mean, that's the, uh, I think the key question here. I mean, and you know, I mean, the name, the name is an abstraction too. I mean, we, whether we have Merkle trees or what we have is uh, uh, something else, but. Um, uh, uh, in my view, uh, every uh, uh, every uh, name uh, has an origin, has a location that's an origin, and um, uh, uh, so it's uh, 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 it's. Uh, In essence, it's reference through um, uh, well, I'm not maybe getting uh, I don't know if, if I'm answering it, but. I, you know, I, I see it. I see them as a higher um, in the sense, or as a tree. Uh, uh, 
uh, which is structure. Mm. Uh, so is there nesting of these ambience? I'm sorry? Is there like nesting of these uh, ambience? Because the like, I don't know, I mean- I, Absolutely, you know, absolutely. There is, okay. I think this nesting or this fractal nature yeah, is not uh, something that I've seen really, uh, uh, I mean, normally, I, I mean, what I see of it is just ambience within a single environment. Yeah. Entering or leaving ambience within that environment. So that's a hierarchy, right? I mean, yeah, yeah. That's a hierarchy right there. Um, uh, 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 and, uh, and that's the other beautiful thing about it is that it takes these vats, which are unstructured, you know, playgrounds that can do anything, and it gives them formal structure. We can now, you know, say, look inside a vat and say, what vats does it contain? Or what ambience does it contain? And uh, you know, uh, and ultimately we want to apply this down to the metal, but uh, in a hierarchical uh, manner. And one thing occurs to me: why Mark Miller's group doesn't pick up on the ambient calculus because their work came before the ambient calculus significantly before like 30 years before was it was it he working on that back in the 60s even or am i thinking of somebody else jim mark miller um oh gee i, I don't remember well anyway uh, the ambient calculus was 1990 98 according to oh 98 okay well see that's that's a lot lighter i mean so, uh, luca luca cardelli was one of the yeah I, I, i'm not familiar with uh andrew gordon i am familiar with luca cardelli though because he, he did a lot of stuff with the uh, spatial logic for concurrency uh him and uh louis uh Kyres, they they have like this humongous paper like two-part paper about this uh, spatial logic for concurrency it's all about this uh, behavioral type stuff. And uh, the Cardell is also about uh, objects, objects, and uh, you know, different. Oh, okay. Object-oriented stuff. Which is oh, cool. So, Builder was managing rights was in two thousand and two. Oh, is that all? I, I thought oh, that was you first published. A oh, reimagining rights. That paper was in uh, two thousand and six. Okay, I guess I am confused. But then there's, I, I, I'm confused because I see, I also see a 2002 copyright. I guess it was, uh, it was, it says first published 2006. And then it has copyright of 2002. <laughs> Weird. So this is somehow re related to what we started on this uh, uh, system processes and uh, Mike mentioned the uh, assemblies, right? So yeah, I'm hoping that that some of you guys uh, uh, ch uh, check out that uh, white paper on the ambience, uh, so that I don't have to. Uh, so that I don't have to. <laughs> Get, get into the muck there. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely on the list. <laughs> uh, I mean, is it consensus related? Could could this conversation spill into an earlier Friday conversation? <laughs> um, good question. Probably, uh, uh, I mean, it's all related. I mean, it's the you know, the, the very specific model of having uh, VATs that are validators uh, connects them, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, 
And I think ultimately we have uh, 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 we have some kind of error correction all the way down in our real systems. We have error correcting memory that we're running on our on our bats, which are our machines. Um, yeah, I, I'm looking more at Mark Mark Miller and the Agoric papers, and, and that stuff is not as early as I thought it was. Ah. Oh, their GitHub white paper is not linked in a very good way, but unfortunately, they work for. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong stuff here. Yeah, the, the contents of this ambient white paper sound really interesting. Talking about capabilities and co-capabilities. I did an example reduction the other day when I first read that. Oh, of uh, with the ambient calculus? Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. It wasn't so bad. Do you guys want to do a reduction? Uh, what are the primitives of the ambient calculus? Like, what is what are the the constructs? Do you uh, are you looking at their white paper? Uh, yeah, I, yeah, let me share my screen just to make sure the sh screen share actually works. You guys can see that, right? Looks, looks great. Hey, perfect. Okay, that's, that's amazing. Um, let's see, what section should we go to? I think it was the one right after that. I think it was number four where they start to actually, oh, that looks really short actually. I don't, I'm not sure. Let me find it. Okay. Yeah, uh, there was there was something where they actually uh, see. Unfortunately, they have this contents. It looks like all of these are linked, but it seems like they're all just linked back to the same exact page. I opened an issue about that. Oh, you did. Oh, yeah. great. Because I would love to be able to click that and have it go to that, but it doesn't. It just, if if you re if you go to their PDF, the yeah. links work properly. By the way, it's in three, right? Is where they said it should be. Uh, but I don't see it here. Okay. Um. All right. Well, either way, uh, we have the Wikipedia article. Maybe uh, this. What about the computation model? I mean, should we? We want to. Uh, I'd be happy to say what I know about it, which is definitely not very much. <laughs> well, why, why, why don't you show us, Josh, what you know? <laughs> being helpful. Sure. Oh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, let me just get an editor. So, uh, okay. So, there's uh, this is a simple process. Let me make that bigger, actually. So this is an ambient, its name is A, and it's empty. It doesn't have anything inside of it. And we can compose it in parallel with other ambients, like this. And they don't have to be named uniquely. So that's a perfectly good process. Um, so let's see, I'm going to just keep looking at my whiteboard for, for what I have over there. And uh, okay, so here's an example reduction. So the, the term that I was given at first was this. Oh, I should, okay, so maybe before we do that, I should, I should do this. This is a simple ambient. Uh, we talked about that. Then there's parallel composition. And we talked about that. And then there's also nested composition, which is like this. So this is the ambient B, which is empty, nested inside of the ambient A, which contains B. Yeah, and so these these ambients, we're thinking of them as like, like uh, execution environments or something, right? Yeah, yeah, that's right. So the ambient, like this, the brackets here represent like this uh, this boundary. I, they called it some kind of boundary, and I can't remember what the, the adjective was, but yeah, that's okay. that's right. It's like an execution environment. Um, and there, there are ways for these things to move in and out of each other or to like, you can dissolve a boundary 
and th those are how some of the reductions happen. Um, I describe it as a bounded place where computation can occur. Oh, yeah, perfect. See, now maybe this is because I don't know anything about anything, but uh, I'm talking about this like execution environment business makes me think of Docker, but I don't know how Docker works, and I wonder how if there are any similarities here. Ooh, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Did you say Docker? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know that much about Docker necessarily either, but that does sound kind of similar. Like you know, if we almost thought of these as like con containers, like right. something could happen inside of this one and different things could be happening inside of this one C and like they're not interacting with each other because they're in totally different ambience. Yeah, right. Well, then, either way, either way. Yeah. Um, so this is mixed composition here. This is definitely not like something new, but it's, uh, you know, just as an example, like we could have an ambient um, and inside of it, we could have like a parallel composition. And then like, you know, paralleled with that is some other. And so like you can mix and match these things basically is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Um, okay. So here's the reduction that, that I was, I, I thought I got this from their, um, from their paper. Well, well, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do this actually first too. There's a, there's this like in, I think they call them capabilities, right? And so it could look like, it could look like this. So let's say we have A and inside of A, there's this capability that says in C. And then in parallel, there's a, an ambient and it has an authorization co-capability like that. So the co-capabilities have the underscore after them. Sorry, that's one. Okay, so basically what this is saying is that this ambient A wants to enter into the ambient C, which is in parallel with it, but it can't do that unilaterally. It also needs an authorization in the ambient C that says like, okay, I authorize, I'm gonna allow something to come into me and that's ambient A. So then this reduces to C A. That's interesting. This sounds a lot like sends and receives and broke out the list with my yeah. this, is, this is what they call ambient authority. Ambient authority. Okay. And it's and uh, in the uh, what's the uh, uh, the web protocol uh, C S D or something? It's, the, uh, it's how you get authority to do something in another environment. Um, let me look it up. You know what I'm I talking know, about in the way? I know, I know Dan uses the term ambient authority when he's talking about, as like a, almost like a four letter word when he's talking about object capabilities. And in that context, ambient authority means like, oh, any piece of code anywhere can do this thing, like print to the screen or have some other side effect. Now as this is, this is exactly ambient authority right here is what we're looking at. Ooh, yeah. Okay, and the, why it's a dirty word is because it's most commonly associated with access control lists. Okay, yeah. access control list is one way of doing ambient authority. But it's not the only way. <laughs> I, I uh, Correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong here or what is it i'm seeing a parallel between these ambience and namespaces yeah um it, it's it's basically saying you know uh, uh you know you can think of a vat as a namespace right it's an area where 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 things names have their own meaning that outside that space they have no meaning Right. Um, uh, uh, and you know, here in in defining an ambient authority, we're saying that C is allowed to go into this namespace, whatever, uh, and access names in this space. Okay, um, uh, and that's different from. Uh, I guess object capabilities in that uh, 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 we don't normally want to go in and be able to access all the names that are in a space. 
Okay, that would be too much power, and that's scary. Okay, but there is a namespace that we're going into, which is sort of like the, all the messages that an object understands. Okay, those names of those that the object understands, and we can think of the object as being the ambient, the namespace that it exposes is the operations that that object supports or whatever, or that things that happen within that ambient. Okay, and um, so uh, uh, it, from an object capabilities point of view, uh, uh, we want to consider um, uh, the definition of this ambient to be a uh, interface to a VAT that can be exposed or not. So I don't, you know, I have to think about it a little bit more how that how that relates to e-rights, but. Um, That's the basic idea, but here we're explicitly saying um, that uh, uh, that uh, uh, A is going to be allowed into the namespace C because C allows A into that namespace. Okay. Yeah, I'm starting to. Uh, yeah, I'm starting to like this more. So, uh, but, but this A uh, go into into C. Uh, this C becomes uh, visible to A, right? Or and, right. And with all with all other things that uh, C have. Or yeah. So whatever um, you know, like there might have been more interesting things in there. And now A is a, a peer with them, so it can do, it can interact with them in other ways now, either by entering them or them entering it or dissolving their boundaries or something like that. I see, and, uh, uh, and, and the name C, if, if it's already defined in A, so how is this uh, result? Yeah, the name C is defined in A. I don't know about that. That's a good question. Yeah. Or what? Yeah. Is there any some substitution? Or yeah. A and C have to be in the same ambient in order to address each other. Right. Yeah. When we have something like this in C, this is going to work for any C that's a sibling of A, like in par in parallel composition with A. So it's just like, uh, so, you know, we might have actually like, uh, maybe I'll add another thing over here. There might be like, um, really deep, but like, uh, okay. So there's another C over here. This went, the thing that A is trying to enter, it can't be this C because that C is nested way deeply down inside of one of A's peers, but it can be this C because they're, they're in parallel composition. So, so for that, uh, I don't. I guess A to have access to that nested C, you would first need to be granted access to B and E, right? To yeah, it would have to move inside of E and then move. Oh, sorry, move inside of D, then move inside of E. Yeah. Or by some other reductions, C could move outside of E, and then D gets dissolved or whatever. But yeah, by some reductions, they have to become parallel with one another. Yeah. Just almost just like if you have a send and a receive and you're trying to calm them, like it's not going to work if the send is nested deeply in some other continuation somewhere that they both have to be top level before they can calm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, you know what? I just realized though, I'm not sure. Like I know in RoCalc, only top level things can calm. You can't like start reducing continuations while they're still in continuations. I'm not sure if that's a rule here or not. Like if there's some. Thing that's nested kind of deeply, but then there's like two things that could reduce. I don't know if they can reduce immediately or not. I'm not sure how that works. Yeah. Um, but I, so I found 
part of the paper that I that I was looking for, but somewhere they also, it's more than just in, there's also out and open. Oh, here's an example of out. That's pretty tiny though. Whoops. Oh, I lost it. Oh no. There we go. Nope. There we go. So I guess A is saying it wants to come out of B and then in, it's in parallel with this out A, which is allowing A to move out of B. So then we get this. Oh, actually, that's a perfect example of something inside another ambient reducing. So I guess you can reduce anywhere all willy-nilly. And then here's open. So, we, so this open underscore, like the authorization, it doesn't have an argument, you know, whereas here we had like out A or we had, you know, in A or whatever. The open authorization means you can open me myself. Like in this case, it means you can open ambient B. And uh, since that's in parallel with an open B, then this B boundary gets dissolved. So that's pretty much uh, as much as I know. <laughs> these, these, I, I, I'm going to coin a phrase and. and Tell me whether you love this or hate it. Let's call these mobile process namespaces. Yeah, for the ambience. Yeah. Yeah, that seems pretty accurate from my limited understanding. What did you call it? Mobile process namespaces. Yeah. Because these these are like little namespaces, but now with this calculi, we can we can comfort it comfortably move these things in and out of other other namespaces, you know, safely, right? Yeah. You know? And you know you can think of it as, you know, your your environment is a virtual reality. You know, where you travel from one space to another uh, and have effect effect in those in, in different spaces. By my yeah, you can you can inter, you can intermingle within those those spaces, right? You can the the, the space you can affect the space, and the space can affect you. Right. You can open the door between spaces, or you can close the door. Right. You can make a larger space. Boy, I like this. It's just just another way of of building the calculus from a different viewpoint, which, which gives us uh, a, a, a completely different set of, 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 of uh, powers. Yeah. I mean, these are all things we could do in the row calculus, but not, not easily. Yeah, I'm wondering, I don't know if these are computationally equivalent or if like one is more or less expressive than the other one. Yeah, is that is that what it has to do with is expressivity? Or... Yeah, so that's the I guess expressivity is is like uh, answers the question of like okay, can we encode the ambient calculus in the row calculus or or vice versa? And if like if you can do both, then they're equally expressive. I Does think that Greg really mentioned uh, that uh, there is no. Uh, implementation of uh, uh, between ambient and the pi calculus. So. There's there's no way to encode ambient in pi calculus. He said. He said that uh, he don't know about uh, uh, this implementation. Yeah, yeah. So, I'm wondering. They may be. Well, I have to go. I, I have to uh, go to another meeting. Hopefully, I'll be back. I'll let you continue as usual on Friday. <laughs> I don't know that I have much left to, to say today, but I'm willing to listen if anybody else is. What meeting are you going to? Uh, dig, dig Life? Yeah, there's a Storts meeting at Dig Life. I probably should go to that as well. I, I haven't been, been to those in ages. Cool. Are, cool. You, a Stort, are you a Stort, Gary? I was at one time. 
a stork? Steward. Oh, oh. Nice. Yeah. I'll go, I'll go and see if I'm still a steward. Cool. Thanks, everybody. Bye, guys. See you guys. Uh, Joshua, can you, can you uh, <laughs> explain this uh, example that you that you, that you written? Yeah, totally. I, I remembered that I forgot to talk about this other primitive, which is it's the dots, but it's the prefixes just like in pi calculus. Like you have to, or um, input guards, I think is what they call them. Or just maybe just guards. I, I can't remember. But uh, like you have to do this in A, and then that exposes the in B and the in, in D. So this, I guess maybe this is more like the um, nesting something inside a continuation where we can't do anything with this in B until we've already handled the, the in A. So like my, so I, this was the example I, I made up for myself and I have an answer that I think is the right one, uh, but I'm curious, I just would love to go over it again. So I took this as like A is trying to go enter inside a C and so we can like consume this in A authorization. So I reduced it to this. That term is totally unchanged. This term is partially changed. And this last one is totally unchanged. And so then the question is like, okay, well, what other reductions can we make? Uh, now you can put B inside C. Yeah. Wait right. a second. Doesn't A go inside of C? Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, and that just happens in parallel. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good catch. Right. I forgot to actually put the A in there. <laughs> oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and then, yeah, I think what Thomas Love said is also right. So then we can... Uh, do that with that. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay, and then this one's unchanged. And then I think D can go in C. I think it's the other way around this time. C is going to go. Oh, into yeah, yeah. So then we're left with just, uh, I guess I'll just stick on the left margin. So let's see, this all gets consumed. Yeah. This gets consumed. So we put C into there and then whatever was left inside of C was A part B. That's the same thing I had the other day. <laughs> yeah. But I don't know how to do, um, reductions with the the open ones where where is their reduction rule for the open one i know you, sh you showed it yeah i don't there it is okay so let's see oh right right yeah, okay so so we have some ambient b that wants to open up for whatever reason, and we need it to be in parallel with that open B operation, right? The action or the capability or whatever in the world they're calling it. Yeah, right. So this C is like, it's good. I mean, out, right? Yeah, so B wants to mm -hmm. spill its guts. Yeah. That's, uh, I guess, this open underscore part, right? Yeah. And then this is the thing that makes it actually happen. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's interesting. Now I'm like almost thinking this is like uh, somehow related to like public key crypto or something, you know, like open underscore is like a lock or something. And then open B is, you know, like that key that opens the lock or something along those lines. But maybe that's like a stupid analogy, I don't know. But I, I was thinking uh, uh, on, on Greg's, um, uh, you know, king that you, uh, that you supply you know, to, to make a reduction. Wait, what? Oh, the, the context? 
the yeah yeah the context and the like a, like a, uh, uh, I forgot the word yeah when you have some some kind of chemical reaction and you put some oh. for uh, the uh, com catalyst. Com catalyst, yeah, 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 exactly. Mm -hmm. Chemical reaction is what got me to catalyst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking reagent and I knew that was wrong. <laughs> yeah. Cool. Yeah, I was thinking like, right What was that? Yeah, the creation word was on the mind, but it's very really similar, but that's <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I wonder. I wonder how similar this ambient calculus is to that uh, space-time bro calculus. And uh, yeah, and, and, and uh, I was I was asking the gym uh, for for this. Does these names have some kind of structure? This A B C, because I'm, I'm thinking uh, like from from where these names are coming. So our alcohols or yeah, it doesn't look. I mean, it doesn't look like they say in the paper. At least they just have some n, and they don't even say where the n comes from, as far as I can see. Because they just have like n brackets with a p inside, and p is like a process. And you know, processes can have like actions to be one of these ambients or uh, be run in parallel with one another, but it doesn't really say where this N is coming from. Is actions what they're calling the in and out and open? Yeah, well, yeah, well, they're, it's a little bit weird because uh, they're calling that M dot P. Uh, they're saying wait for action M before continuing as process P. So that's exactly like uh, you know input guard or something like that, or you know I guess uh, if you're in like synchronous pi calculus, it could be input or output action. Um, and but then they go to well yeah I mean they're calling this M capabilities and co capabilities specifically, but then they're like oh yeah by the way in parentheses this is actions. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they're they're not even saying where their names are coming from, so it probably is like a, you know, um, like a pi calculus sort of thing. Like just just pretend you have this infinite supply of names and and some sort of notion of equality on these names. And uh, these actions uh, are are they similar to to some kind of uh, to, uh, are these actions create some kind of logical formula to between uh, ambient terms. So yeah, there's got to be like some you know, sort of transition system or something that you can perform. Oh, which uh, spe speaking of label transition systems, I've seen that come up in a in a couple different contexts now, like all relating to like high calculus or something along those lines. And uh, I know we had talked about. The label transition system from the row calculus, and it wasn't clear to me why we had the transitions that we did. Um, but my understanding now is we think of a process as kind of like, um, you know, it, it, its own separate thing that could have an environment, and in that environment there are other processes. So the label transitions are basically uh, so they're either the transitions are silent. Or they're like these other ones with labels like output or input or something along those lines. And uh, the silent uh, transitions, they usually call like tau. Um, those are like from from a, an internal reduction, like a computation that the process makes just internally. Um, whereas all of the other transitions are about communicating with the environment. And that was something that I hadn't really made a connection. Uh, with and didn't, didn't really understand why we needed, you know, five different transitions instead of just the one reduction transition that we knew of already. Yeah. So what were the uh, what are the other ones then? Uh, so they were. Um, uh, let me. I can find something real quick. Um, so they were they were about a process interacting with its environment. So they're like you know send and receive and. Um, 
think we have one for like name restriction. Uh, give me one second. I'll, I'll find something I have today. I think it's in this book. When, when you say an environment, you mean um, like a when you when you uh, create new names, right? This is like environment for 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 the process in in in, in Roland. Um, hold on one second. I want to make sure this is what I think it is. Uh, yeah. So hold on. check this out. So this is pretty similar to the uh, the transitions that they had and um, that that rolling specification. I think that's where that stuff came from. I honestly don't even remember. Uh, but you know, like traditional stuff like um, you know reduction rule um, just on you know like the process itself so you know th this is like a, a synchronous one so you know this is like a, a send and a receive and, and they have choice and they're doing the, the normal high calculus reduction uh, same stuff with like pars and name restrictions and structural equivalents like everything is the same there for those reduction rules, but then they also have this stuff that they call commitments. And the commitments are like, um, you know, kind of as they're, they're ex I think they explain it there, maybe they, they don't really. Uh, these commitments are basically like the label transitions um, in, you know, for a process like in an environment that has other processes running in parallel with it. So like, if you want to focus your attention on like some specific piece of like a huge, like, Part of processes. I, I guess that's the way to think about it. I'm not really sure. Uh, but this this tau is like the usual um, one. Oh, that was weird. When I highlighted, they don't show the tau. But either way, uh, this this tau transition is um, just like the usual reduction stuff. So they're saying like p reduces to q implies. I'm pretty sure that's a typo with the the prime there. Uh, but they're just saying like this is the the usual um, like con reduction. And uh, and then they're saying like for yeah so now <clears throat> now they're labeling these transitions with like an output label or an input label and I know we had talked about this uh, yeah like I said in in relation to to rolling in the the label transition system for row calculus. Um, but yeah, I think the intuition is like we have this process and it's interacting with some other processes that we're not even really considering the nature of. Uh, and the way that it can interact with them is it can send this name N on this channel M basically. And then same same thing for like uh, input and then, you know, all the stuff like regardless of what your transition is, if your processes are structurally equivalent, then you should have uh, that same kind of label transition between them. Yeah. But um, but either way, I guess the, the point is that um, this this tau is like somehow an internal thing, uh, and these input and output uh, transitions are are like interacting with an environment somehow. And, and, and this interaction with, uh, with the environment, it's like, is, is it uh, similar to interaction with the uh, top space in, 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 in the role process? Yeah, I, I think so. That, that's how I'm thinking about it, at least. Um, like this, um, what am I trying to say here? Yeah, so I guess the, the way that I understand it would be, um, you know, I want to, uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, deploying some code or whatever, and uh, I'm not even, I don't know the right words to use, but either way, like I want to run this code and uh, you know, the way for me to, to run this code in the, you know, um, 
in, again, I have no idea what your words to use here. They're probably wrong. Uh, so I want to run this code. There's already some code executing, and this is going to be executed in parallel with that stuff. So then the way that this is going to interact with all of that other stuff, so like the tuple space or you know some code that's already executing in parallel is through this, this set. And that's the only way that this can interact with, with this other uh, code that's already running. I don't know if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. but. Are, are there defining this uh, uh, this how how can you uh, have this uh, environment or, or, or this context or this type of space right uh, for 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 Varakakos, uh, all of the all of the variables are like global right you have this big list of uh, of key values, and uh, all of these keys are, are you know they are dis distinct. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm just thinking that are they pre presenting this uh, translation to, to to this map or, or some kind of structure that you can apply these rules? Because I, now I'm understanding the uh, uh, what Greg was saying that. Uh, you're, you're translating this operation to to some collection so I'm, I'm just trying to think in these terms I'm trying to, to imagine this collection right? and how these operations are um, exactly mapped to to, to to operations on this collection does this make sense uh, I'm, I'm I'm, not to me. I, I don't really know what you're referring to. Uh, so wait, what do you what do you mean when you're saying like mapping it to collections? So on uh, uh, Greg's lect lectures, he was he was saying that you, you know you translate each of the terms in the calculus to uh, some collection, uh, uh, like like a tuple space. Like you, 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 each of these terms will will do. Uh, some operation on, on collection, like union intersection, right? So, and so, are they specifying uh, something like that for for, for onion How how you how you store this environment? Right? Because I'm, I'm thinking how you manipulate the names. Like right? in your calculus, all all the names are global, so you can easily say, I can just create a new name. This is like nested, and everything is fine. But if you don't have this for a name, you have the same problem with, with, with the lambda calculus. How do you separate the names? You, you must put the names inside and, you know. So. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Are they had uh, any, any implementation? Uh, what from this paper? Yeah. Uh, uh, if they do, I didn't get to that section yet. Um, I think this is more of a, oh, they do have some sort of model checker that comes out of all of this theory. I, I haven't, I mean, we're already even past the, the part that I've gotten to, so I'm not sure. Yeah, I would like to understand this. <laughs> Uh, this is, yeah, this is this is a very interesting paper. I mean, this is, you know, so he's he's saying that they have some sort of, uh, well, they're going to show some model checking is decidable for some class of processes, like uh, given this. So they're developing some sort of, uh, you know, logic that blends these uh, spatial, um, uh, like, constructs with, you know, some behavioral properties. Uh, so there's, like, you know, some, some, modal operators on the level of like a logic on top of the calculus uh, and also talk about behavior so you can actually um, oh so one thing one thing that came up that I thought was pretty interesting and I know this has come up before is uh, how do you encode choice into like the row calculus without a choice construct 
Um, and so they, they do, they show an encoding of, uh, so they have like, you know, two, two processes, say like two sends or something. Um, you know, it's a synchronous calculus, right? So it's like, you can have a continuation on send. Uh, and it's like they do, you know, their first send and then the continuation is some other send. Um, and they're saying that this is strongly bisimilar to um, basically having either order of those sends with a choice between them, right? So it's either going to happen, you know, one way or the other, essentially, like either the first process will go and then the second one. Um, sorry, I think I said that wrong already. So on the left side of the bisimilarity, it's two sends in parallel with one another. On the right side of the bisimilarity, it's those two same processes, those two sends in either execution order, basically. And there's a choice operator between them. Um, and so one thing is, is that these things behave in the same way in terms of like a, a bisimilarity, uh, but they're structurally different. So you can still like use this logic to distinguish them on the level of structure even though there is no distinction on the level of behavior, if that makes sense. Okay. Because you have a, you have a formula that can basically uh, separate these processes. So the formula that separates them is uh, basically saying that there's like two uh, like non uh, null threads running essentially, like two non null processes in parallel on the left side that that you know, two sends in parallel would satisfy that formula. Uh, but on the right side, it won't because you just have a choice. You don't have any, any parallel composition whatsoever, right? So it's like you can distinguish them structurally, but you can't distinguish them behaviorally. That's how I understand it, at least. Uh, so, so if you have, on the left side, you have two, two processes in parallel, two sends in parallel. Yeah. Uh, but they, they both, but they, they, will, they will both be executed, right, and added to, to double space. So on the right hand side, if you have a choice, only one will will be added to double space. So, so this is like a different behavior. And you are saying they are by similar. Yeah, from the, I'm just trying to find it now. So, um, I am probably looking in the wrong paper. Okay, never mind. I'm mm -hmm. not going to show it. There we go. Right, I'll even stop sharing. Um, did, did you say that on the on the right hand side you have a choice, or, or I, I misunderstood? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, maybe I should type out what I'm talking about. It'll make more sense. Uh, yeah. So something like. This font bigger. Oh, well. Um, well, you have the same editor as, uh, as Josh. I know, which is why I knew to go there, but now I can't find where to make it bigger. Tab width is pretty Yeah, fun. there you go. Oh, okay. here we go. Use. Uncheck that, yeah. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, okay. I used to teach programming classes on gedit and this was a minute of every class. Oh right? man. <laughs> Way too many clicks away. Yeah. So so I'm saying uh, we have some uh, send like this, you know, send of the name uh, B on the channel A in parallel with um, I don't even think it matters what they are, send of C on B or something like that. And uh, I don't have good notation for it, but uh, they're saying that this is strongly bisimilar to uh, something like this, A, B, and then afterwards doing this and B, and then with choice uh, doing C, B. Oh, I see that. I see. Oh, that's a great example. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so they're saying that these, these are strongly bisimilar, uh, but so they're, they're in some sense behaviorally equivalent. Uh, but they're not structurally equivalent or you know in terms of like the the this logic that they have for for the structure um be, because basically i mean this this left formula right or uh this this left process this is you know pretty clearly right like some parallel composition of two you know non-null threads so they would say that this uh 
I, I don't know if this is the right notation, but it satisfies some formula that basically looks like this, not the null process and par with, you know, not the null process, basically. So this, this process satisfies this formula. And, and so uh, what this term means in the formula is anything structurally equivalent to like the, you know, stop process. Uh, so, so this is clearly not structurally equivalent to the stop process. And so it's in this, um, you know, uh, it has this property of, you know, uh, satisfying this formula, not zero basically. Um, and then all the par means is that uh, there's there's one piece of the process that satisfies my woman. There's one piece of the process, namely this one, that satisfies that formula, and then there's one piece of the process, namely that one, that satisfies that formula, basically, right? Um, and, but uh, but this thing does not satisfy the same um, uh, formula because there's no par in there, right? Because there's no par. Yeah, exactly. the the like bar equal thing it means satisfied the thing on the left satisfies the formula on the right yeah yeah so um uh semantically the way that they interpret this formula right it's like uh with that um uh interpretation map so it's kind of like uh looks like this sort of thing and they say like okay zero the interpretation of that formula is like the set of all processes such that P is, I don't have a good notation for structurally equivalent, but that's what it's gonna be. Uh, so this is like the set of all processes such that P is structurally equivalent to the, the stop process. And then, um, you know, something like uh, any, any formula that you want to write, if I wanna put not in front of that formula, right? We have like, um, you know, like first first order logical symbols, so like not and conjunctive disjunction. Uh, but either way, this is like the set of all processes. So I'd say like proc uh, minus the interpretation of that formula f. Right. So this is just like some set, and that that would be the definition of that. This is you're basically taking like the complement set here, I guess, right? Yeah, exactly, right. And proc is the set of all possible processes. Proc is the set of all possible processes. Yep. Yeah. And uh, what is the, the the translation for for choice? Uh, for choice. For, for, for plus. For choice. This is exactly what I was thinking. You are translating this for for. for That's so wrong. Mm -hmm. What is the translation for choice? They have the translation for the, uh, the oops, we're way too far. Never mind. Let's go back. I'm glad to hear that because even scrolling past, I was like, oh, oh hey, guess what? There bad. is no translation for choice, which is why I don't remember it. So, um, yeah, okay. So they don't have, so, okay. So each one of, uh, so th this is like their their process constructs, which I didn't even realize this until I started reading the uh, uh, Milner's uh, you know polyadic pi calculus tutorial recently, uh, a little bit further than I've ever looked at it. I didn't realize that he had abstractions, and I've never heard this terminology before, but concretizations, which I think is what that thing is, um, and and. Uh, and this is a little bit weird because they're using these process variables and I mean there's also like this recursion construct uh, but they're using these process variables um, from my understanding to get uh, like a, a higher orderness out of this calculus because apparently the the pi calculus as is is not higher order um, it's only first order and uh, so, so they're using these process variables to get kind of like a higher order characteristic out of the out of the pi calculus that they're using. So they're using some slightly altered version of the pi calculus. I mean, it's got the usual stuff like uh, what they call actions, you know, which are like input output. Uh, it's a synchronous thing, so you could put you know uh, a, a continuation on on either your input or your output, and that continuation can be any kind of process they have that notion of uh, normal processes so that's like you know input or output guarded thing um, and, and you could have choice 
Uh, but basically the, the point being uh, is that I'm not sure why. Um, I, I haven't seen an explanation as to why, but they don't have a, a logical operator that corresponds to this you know, process operator choice. Uh, they do have a logical operator that corresponds to, to R, and, and I mean, it looks exactly the same, right? It's, it's this thing. Uh, but this A and B are, are now formulas, right, in your, in your logic. Uh, same, same with this. I mean, like, you know, this zero is not the stop process, even though they're using literally the same symbol. It's this logical formula that has this particular interpretation. Um, yeah, so I, I don't know why, but they don't have a logical uh, operator for, for the choice operator. Let me see. Interesting that uh, Greg was using this uh, X uh, in, in the in previous version of, uh, of raw calculus. Uh, using what? This X of this N. He was, he was calling this X uh, of U. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. right. Like a, a process variable, basically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know it comes up in um, in the namespace logic stuff. He's got uh, you know propositional variables. I guess is what he calls them, which are you know when you're talking on the on the level of the logic, that's those are the variables that you're using, like propositional variables. Uh, whereas on the level of uh, the calculus, you're talking about you know name variables or or process variables. All right, dudes, I got to get going. Yeah. Good chatting again. Yeah. Oh, it's uh, 1230. Wow. All right. Ooh, my clock says one, two, three, four. Oh, yeah. <laughs> nice. Make a wish, I guess. <laughs> Bye. All right. See you. Okay. See you. Um, Isaac, you, wanted, yeah. you were asking about uh, the uh, process orchestration. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if I was clear on it, uh, that, that uh, uh, the row calculus formalizes that, right? So yeah, uh, right, yeah, and I think the ambient calculus as well, and you know, obviously in a different but related way. Right, and uh, uh, so uh, and in the, in the, in, uh, in the spirit of every way, not just one way. Yeah, there's going to be other ways. But these are oh, yeah. models that we can use, and right. I think these, we can relate these to the OCOPS model. Yeah. Uh, with, uh, uh, and I guess uh, uh, we have to uh, uh, show Dan that uh, we can do uh, uh, ambient uh, ortho uh, 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 ambient authority yeah. in a uh, 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 in, in an OCAPS friendly manner. <laughs> mm -hmm. So um, I may be wrong, but I'm recalling uh, seeing somewhere in, in one of Greg's papers, I think, uh, that the ambient calculus is more expressive than the pi calculus or the row calculus. I'm not really sure which one. I think definitely pi calculus. I don't know about uh, row calculus. Maybe that was like an open question as to uh, how the expressivity of each each relates to one another. Yeah, I remember something like that. Yeah. He had something in uh, was it the reflective reflective abstract syntax? The one the one from Oh, did he talk about it there? I mean, I was on the call. I just, I don't remember. Sometimes they talk about things and I'm not even sure what <laughs> questions to ask, you know? Cause they're, they're all talking about these monoidal categories and uh, functoriality and, and what this means. And I'm like, is that alpha congruence, you know? <laughs> yeah, well, they, he talked about the, uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, ambient calculus there briefly. Yeah. Uh, uh, on, on, on which session? On, on our guest or? Uh, yeah, yeah, just the most okay. most recent one. Thirty-seven. Yeah. Reflective abstract syntax, but uh, I mean, he didn't. 
he, he sort of left uh, uh, left it, you know, and so he was saying that uh, uh, you could do uh, uh, that we haven't that can, that we don't have there's more work to be done oh yeah uh, in order to uh, 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 include the uh, the ambient calculus is what, uh, sort of what, what he was saying, and I didn't. Uh, uh, and I may go back and listen to that after, you know, uh, uh, when I. Uh, <clears throat> now I know a little more what the a, a little bit more about what the ambient calculus is. We <laughs> have to go back and, say, and listen to Greg to see what what he was just saying to me. Um, made sense, of course. I uh, but, uh, yeah, he did uh, uh, talk about that. Probably about uh, maybe about one third of the way through. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know Christian was talking most of the time because he was just. Uh, presenting some kind of like preliminary stuff for uh, research that he's doing. Um, it's pretty interesting stuff though. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you got into it or not, but the, uh, um, and I guess uh, Josh, you probably read more of it. Uh, but I didn't know. Uh, uh, now, what exactly is, there, is the white pack paper about in terms of this? You know, I mean, they have this virtual machine that does ambient calculus, and you use it to do peer-to-peer -peer computation. <laughs> uh, 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 I guess there, uh, it has no consensus mechanism. I don't know. Uh, I guess That's I still have, weird. Still, still have to figure out more about what exactly what this white paper is doing, and you know what's yeah. what uh, uh, how that's going to be used. Yeah, and uh, that, how that where yeah. where uh, like uh, so okay, I understand that this is like the ambience protocol, but like who who is making this thing? Like where are these people coming from? I've never heard of. Networks. Um, yeah. Uh, Do you know anything ab about the individuals that are behind this ambience protocol? Um, the uh, maybe we can call one of them to, to our session. <laughs> that would be cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let me pull the class. Where was it? Um, ambience.org Distributed Computation Protocol for Peer-to-Peer -peer Programs and Data. So, you know, I guess this virtual machine they are setting up so that these things can talk to each other. I don't know. Yeah. Still have to figure out what, exactly what it is you're doing. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I'll, I will probably uh, try to read through some of this white paper before next week just because it seems pretty interesting and I think it, it 
seems on the face value, at least that, that, that there are like are a lot of connections between what we're doing with the row calculus and what this ambient calculus is doing, but I'm not sure exactly what those connections are. Yeah, they have uh, yeah. Uh, the ambient calculus research here with that list of papers. Oh, lecture slides. It may be nice to look over. Um, well, uh, so I, I know it's kind of late, um, but I do have a very little bit of, of uh, code that I wrote up in, in K framework that relates to some stuff that I was talking about last time. I don't know if you guys would be interested to see it. Uh, shouldn't take very long to show it. Um, yeah, sure. Yeah, I mean, pretty pretty much just to refresh uh, your memory, so so we're all on the same page. Uh, so I was trying to do some sort of matching for uh, receipts that had multiple binds in them, and uh, one issue that I could foresee happening was if there was some sort of relationship between the channels that I was listening on. Um, then I would have to have those same relationships. So if I'm trying to match some receive and there are relationships in the, in the channels that I'm listening on in that receive, then those same relationships will have to be satisfied in the, in the one that I want to match with. Um, and so I've made a little bit of progress on that and it's, uh, turning out to be like way more complicated than I was expecting. Um, but at the very least, uh, I do have something to show for it. So uh, what I can, uh, I don't know why my keyboard's not working. Every time I press a button, but uh, so um, yeah, don't pay attention to any of this. I don't know why it just scrolled down like a thousand lines. I uh, can one second. Uh, so what I want, okay, here we go. So I want to show you this, uh, this channel relations set thing. Um, and so basically, uh, what? Okay, so I'll, I'll kind of explain the notation as we're as we're going. Um, but uh, so so basically, like if if there's only one receive in this thing, well then there are no channel relations. It can't possibly be there's only one channel. So just go ahead and uh, not do anything there. So uh, it's going to give me a set, and uh, what the set is going to look like is essentially um, it'll number the the binds. And then tell me if there are relations with any channels on the, for any of the other binds. Um, so uh, maybe you know what? Let me let me show you an example first before I show you the code. Uh, I think that's a good idea. Okay, so something like uh, something like this. So basically I have, uh, here's like, um, so what I'm thinking is I'm going to have, uh, how do I explain this? So I'm going to have two receives, right? Uh, I'm going to ask basically, the question is like, uh, does this uh, first receive, which I'll just call A, uh, does this thing match this other receive, which I'll call B, you know, and, and these are going to be, uh, like I said, the, the interesting case is when uh, each of these receives has, you know, multiple bindings in it. And so um, to answer this question, uh, we'll have to, you know, compute several different things. And um, so basically what I'm saying is we're going to look at the one that I'm trying to match uh, and see what the relations are amongst all the, the channels and the binds there. Uh, so what it's going to do is compute what I'm calling the, the channel relation set. And so what it's going to do is take whatever this receive is and compute this channel relation set. Once it has that, it'll check if uh, this thing satisfies like some similar condition basically. And uh, so to compute the channel relation set, so here's an example, right? So I have some uh, receive here. It's got, you know, one, two, three, four listens in it apparently. Um, and so what I'm looking at is basically this, this, uh, so what it will do is to compute this channel relation set, I'll first look at just the first, uh, binding here. 
and I really don't care what the, the listening names are. I really only care what the channel is. Um, so I'll look at the channel for this first bind and then basically I'll traverse the rest of the binds asking like, okay, is this channel related to this channel in any way? Is it related to this channel in any way? Is it related to this channel in any way, basically? Um, and so the idea is like, uh, and I don't know if this is enough, but this is certainly a good starting point, I think. Um, to see if this is related to any of these things, what I'm gonna do is basically uh, just look at the free variables of this channel. And so here, you know, it's some, uh, you know, quoted process variable. So I put this slash to denote a process variable and separate it from, uh, from a name variable. Um, but either way, so this is some process variable that I'm calling Y. And that's the free variable of this channel. And so I'm going to look at the second one and ask like, okay, here's the second uh, bind. I'm really only looking at the channel for that bind. And so I want to ask like, it basically does a process variable named Y appear anywhere here as like a free variable. And it doesn't, of course, because it's just a variable X. So no relation here. Um, I look at this one and now I'm asking the same question, like does the process variable Y appear as a free variable anywhere here? And it does, uh, it's, it's nested inside, but it's like a quoted send where the name is like some variable X and, and this message is gonna be some, you know, a process variable with the exact same name. Uh, and so the, the way that I'm thinking about this is like, uh, these, these channels are kind of telling me something about um, so the free names of the channels are gonna tell me something about the free names of the entire uh, receive itself. Um, and so if I'm gonna go ahead and like substitute some process in for this uh, process variable Y, uh, then if I were to substitute that process here, then it would also be substituted here and consequently also be substituted here, right? These, these variables all denote the same. So. Must be the same. Yeah, exactly. And, and, so, uh, and so I'm just trying to gather up all of the um, binds whose channels share, a, you know, have a common free variable essentially. Uh, so, so point being is, uh, so this is like, I'll number them. This is like bind zero, this is bind one, this is bind, oops, two uh, and three, right? And so basically I'm saying, yeah, what's up? You are creating like a, a guards, right? Because you, uh, you're you saying that, that, that uh, this Y and this other Y are the same. Yeah, yeah, right. You, you, theoretically, you could name, name it differently and in the guard you could say these one are equals. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you could call this like Y one, Y two, Y three, and then have like an you know if whatever Y one equals Y two equals Y three, yeah. then then we're good. Um, then then we're basically denoting the same exact thing. Um, yeah. So so long story short, right? Um, so this has the free name, uh, free process variable uh, Y. Uh, this one doesn't have any process variables. Uh, this one has a free process variable Y, and this one also has a free process variable Y. So what I'm saying is there's some kind of relation between uh, the zeroth uh, channel, the uh, second channel, and the third channel. So I want to reflect that in this channel relation set somehow, and so this is the way that I'm displaying that relationship. Uh, so it's like nested sets, and so um, the, so, okay, so it, K framework's a little bit weird, but uh, this whole thing is just one set, right? I'm basically saying that, you know, this is, this constitutes the first element of that set. The second line is the second element, the third line is the third element. Uh, there's only three elements. Uh, and so basically this first element is telling me that for the zero if bind that I'm talking about, it's related to two other channels. And those two channels are whatever's in the second position and whatever's in the third position. Um, same story with, uh, and, and so then I'll do this process. So I did it for zero. Okay, zero is done. I can forget about it, right? You can just like erase that or something. Uh, and now we want to do the same thing for the first bind. And so I'll go ahead and ask about the channel. It's got a free name variable X. Uh, so does this one. So does this one. 
And so this one should be related to two and three as well. And so that's why I have this set, you know, one colon, you know, a set with two and three in it. Uh, and then basically same thing with two. Now I've, I've done one, I can erase that. And then now I look at two and the only question I really need to ask is, is there anything in common here and here? And it turns out that there's two things in common, right? Like there's a free name variable X in common and a free process variable Y in common. Okay, great. I just need to know if they're related in any way, shape, or form. Uh, so I'll go ahead and, and put that relationship into this set as well. Um, and so that's basically how the computation is going. It's kind of like choosing this first one, uh, seeing if it's related to any of these others. Uh, it produces this set that's kind of like indexed with a zero. Uh, and then it moves on to the, to the next line. So then it's like, okay, uh, I have this set. It's going to start with one. What should I put here? Well, it's related to two and three. So it puts this set that contains elements two and three there. Um, and then same thing with two. And then basically I'm done at that point. Um, so does that make sense? So you, the last time you, you talked about uh, ordering of these reasons, these bands. Yeah. yeah. So now you are saying uh, you have like zero at first. Uh, so how did you solve? How, how can you say this is the first one? How, how do you know? Oh, so, um, so my claim is that it doesn't matter how these are ordered. Uh, because I'm keeping track of what number I'm calling them, I can always refer back to them. So like regardless of how they're actually ordered, you know, like, I mean, if I took this one and, you know, moved it somewhere else, let's say I take this one and like move it over here or something, uh, it shouldn't, it shouldn't actually matter. Uh, but now the, now the numbers will change, right? So now this one's number one and this one's number two and this one's number three. So the order really doesn't make any difference other than this, like, this is the order that they appeared in syntactically. And so I'm just like relating back to those things. But if I actually change that order now, I'd have to like change all of these numbers, you know. But you will get the same set. This is what you're saying. This uh, relation, you... I will get the same set up to the reordering of the numbers that I just did, right? Because basically I just did, um, I don't know, maybe maybe this is confusing, but uh, maybe, maybe I, uh, so I just took what was bind one and made it bind three. Um, so basically I, I did some sort of transformation like one went to three, um, uh, let's see, I think two went to one uh, and three went to two basically. So my claim is if I apply this mapping to this set, I'll get what I should get if I were to run this channel relationship uh, mm. set on, on this receiver. So, so you need to run, uh, so you need to check all these combinations. Uh, you no know structural equivalence of this uh, relation set. Right. So, um, if you want to find the match, right, you, you, you yeah. must know all, all of the uh, combinations. Yeah, right. So I'm saying, yeah, as an even more preliminary check, uh, what I'll need to do is check if there are any relationships amongst these channel names. And so I'm just computing this channel relations set essentially, right? And so then the, the whole point is like, okay, um, if this is the, the case, uh, maybe let me go back to the original ordering of things here. Uh, oops, that's the original ordering of things. Uh, so, so given this particular ordering of these binds, Right, this is the, the set that I produce for the relations. Um, so what I'm saying is uh, if I have, if I'm trying to, so that was just for this like to be matched with a C, right? I need to check the relations there. Uh, if there are any, which there are in this case, then I'll have to make sure that some analogous relations are, are matched or you know, are also demonstrated by, by this received A. Uh, and so the way that I'll have to do that is, you know, whatever way these um, binds are ordered, I'll generate this, this relation set for, for the channels. And then I'll have to figure out like, okay, is the zeroth bind supposed to be matching with the zeroth bind? Or maybe, maybe it's some other one, you know, maybe the third bind is the one that's actually going to match with this, right? Because the ordering shouldn't matter for the binds. Um, Somehow this. But uh, in the end, you will you will find the same order. Yeah, I'll, I'll find the I'll find you the must same. Must find the same for sure. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. So then that's kind of uh, 
one one thing that I can do right is to try and figure out which which of these binds should even potentially match with another one is I can figure out these relations between all of these channels and then that's like a preliminary thing to start with uh, eliminating possibilities for for all these different permutations right because in in general the only way to check if n things matches and other things is to check all n factorial possible combinations and like this is a complete and utter headache and you don't want to do that every single time right because that is uh you know kind of like a, an exponential mm -hmm. sort of operation that you're doing there um yeah, yeah. The, the, the worst case is uh if all the bytes are the same right but in that case you yeah. very easily find the the, the this relation set is the same for all of the combinations, so you really need to, to calculate all the one. Right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So if all the binds are the same, well, then this doesn't really give me a whole lot of uh, information to start eliminating options from. Yeah, yeah. And if they are totally different, you yeah. can first uh, check uh, are they matching in the, in the structure, right, before yeah. uh, creating this, uh, uh, this relation set. And after when you do that, you will, you will have like some kind of ordering. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I'm thinking also what I'm going to have to do is somehow uh, represent this collection of lines as a set, anyways. You know, it'll have to be some sort of. Uh, I I want it to be like a, a multi set, but there's no construct for a multi set, so I'll have to make you know turn sets into multi sets basically, and uh, and and deal with them there. And I think there's a good way to do it, um, but I haven't I haven't done anything with that yet. Um, but, but yeah, so that's that's basically the idea for this uh, for this channel relation set. So uh, like I said, I mean the the algorithm for computing this right is basically like look at the first one, uh, compute all of the relations for all of the other ones, and then look at the you know second one, and then do the same thing, so on and so forth until you you know computed one of these relation sets for, for each one of these binds and then uh, you do some special union basically because uh, I'll be generating things that really won't union well um, because I want to union kind of like these uh, inside sets you know because I have like nested sets so I want to union the inside set so I basically remove the outer one and then I can do some unioning on, uh, on, on the inner one as long as the index is right. Thanks Isaac. The uh, yeah. intelligence meeting is starting now. Cool. So uh, okay. welcome to stick around for that. I'm going to restart the Zoom here so we'll process our video. Cool. Uh, thanks all.